there are different paths to reach where you want to be i think with any spiritual journey there's three things that you need shastra sadhana and sangha everyone is searching for is the truth that is the core, That's the core. of all spiritual exploration in hinduism there are four purposes of life one of them is money because money is again looked at very in a negative kind of way wealth without values is, is not, not going to stay i feel like the fundamental question that people should ask themselves mm -hmm. is what does an effective life consist like. of Our guest today was a senior of mine in school. He was the apple of the eye of all the teachers. Went on to studying at the coveted London School of Economics. He then landed a job at a big four and then UK's largest commercial bank. On top of all of that, my mother loved him just because his name was Om Dhumatkar and he was a good, tall, sweet Maharashtrian boy. It's insane. He literally is the Sharma ji ka beta in my life. When my parents are like, "Why can't you be like him? Can you just stop raising the bar, Om?" And on top of it all, he has now gone back to his roots and is creating content on spirituality. Great. One more thing that my mother loves you for. And now she love you for knowing who Shashikant Dhotre is as well. So, congratulations, my mother's favorite uh from a far uh, high school senior of mine <laughs> welcome om thank to our so show <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having me it's fantastic being here and i you know if it's any consolation i never aspired to be the favorite of anyone's <laughs> mother <laughs> but you know here we are well here we are and i i swear to god this is something that my mother will watch and my mom will be like hey om Really, she's please good. share amongst family and friends on WhatsApp. <laughs> yes, hundred <laughs> percent. Plug in right here, right off the bat. I absolutely love it. So, just um, going back to your origin story a bit. Um, a lot of people ask us how to get into the world of finance, how to yes. land that coveted job that you already have. You're a commercial banker, right? So let's begin by asking you what a commercial banker actually does. So I'll answer that uh, first, clarifying that mm -hmm. I am head of strategy for the commercial bank. Okay. But I'm not a client-facing commercial mm -hmm. banker, and that's a a, a career choice I made mm -hmm. quite early. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, firstly, thank you for recounting my. Uh, academic history uh, <laughs> it's not often that i get to talk about the london school of economics but it was a great know, time i'm hoping it was phenomenal it was the best you mm -hmm. know three year education one could have hoped for Damn. um that's it, saying a lot it was a lot of effort paying off the student loan i'll tell you that <laughs> uh, but, take note everyone it's not cheap to go to london school of no, economics and and not everyone who goes to the school that we went to is yeah. is you know endowed with a lot of wealth i mm -hmm. certainly only managed to go to that school as a result of a very substantial scholarship uh which then enabled me to take out a loan that i spent a long time because um, he's a smarty and he got a scholarship <laughs> <laughs> well it took it took some time to pay it off so yeah. i mean i think education and lending and debt is is a huge thing that that you Massive. know i'm sure we'll spend some time talking about mm -hmm. um my journey into finance is actually a really interesting one mm -hmm. so I uh when I was at university I had relatively little idea of what I wanted to do in the sense that I had a broad interest in journalism okay. and you know international organizations mm -hmm. like the UN but very quickly realized that that's not going to help me make a dent in my student loan yeah <laughs> and so I started considering new roles uh which included consultancy uh -huh. and I applied to all of the big consultancies as one may expect to and uh in my final year received seven rejections wow. uh which was the grand total of the number of places that i had applied to seven rejections in hurt. 24 hours oh so you know i was uh, i was a tad anxious yeah. getting do you think it was because you were an international student i i i think it was a variety of reasons mm -hmm. i feel like as an international student you are learning to speak two languages at the same time mm -hmm. you know one is obviously english um in in terms of the in local their, yes. conversation 
um, there's a lot of words that we use here in India that they we don't, just don't use outside. Yeah. You know, English words that yes. we won't use. Uh, yeah. As such, per such, whereas <laughs> these are not words that are used yeah. outside of India as much. You know, so you're learning to sort of converse in ways that that are conversant with people. Uh, but also you're learning the language of business, which I think is yes. a language in and of itself. Mm. And I don't think I was sufficiently conversant in either at that point. Plus, I also feel that as foreign students, we don't invest enough time in getting to grips with what we need mm -hmm. to really have a career abroad. You know, we need those internships when we can get our hands on yeah. them. We need those referral letters. We need yeah. to have that network. And I think that's something a lot of students, particularly people like me who come from, you know, the, uh, I would say the upper end of working class rather than middle <laughs> class even. Yeah. Um, struggle with because yeah. you know we have no frame of reference for that and, and so we're, we're so focused on the education itself we are told that you know Achha padhai karo and then you'll be fine and and things will work themselves yeah. out yeah and so i found myself with seven rejections in 24 hours wondering what i'm going to do Hectic. and then one day on my way to class i saw a sign uh, outside of our classroom door saying that there's an event by this small consultancy mm -hmm. uh, that works in global economics okay. and come along if you want you know if you want no, to learn like, more might as well so i showed up um, and i sat at the back of the room mm -hmm. and i listened to three people present two senior well one senior person one relatively junior person who was very charismatic and one junior person who was not that charismatic. Okay. So um, at the end of the session, walking up to them, I was, because I was sat at, at the back, the senior person was taken first. Mm -hmm. Then the junior person who was charismatic was taken. So I was, left, one was I, was, I was left waiting for the charismatic one when the non-charismatic person came and started talking <laughs> to me. But... Um, you know, I only realized in hindsight that the, the charismatic one had already lined up a job somewhere else. Mm. So all of the people who got their, his visiting card um, suddenly lost their contact in that company. Yeah. Uh, and I was, you know, I was left being the only one. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was in uh, the spring of 2008. Okay. So uh, luckily I got a job at this company, started. And within six weeks of joining, the global financial crisis hit, oh. you know, and that that was actually quite an amazing experience in retrospect. At that time, it was really scary. Yeah. Um, but when you look back at it, you know, our deal book dried up mm. overnight yeah. and uh, it was becoming increasingly clear that the job itself was Maybe unlikely to last mm -hmm. uh, and the company itself was unlikely to last mm -hmm. in its, its, its current form. So um, I started looking again and, and then I was accepted into a global big four, um, big four <laughs> consultancy which was which was great fun you know mm -hmm. we started off being shipped away to scotland to be trained for for a few weeks nice. and you know we went the highlands so it was beautiful um but i decided when i joined that consultancy is that i am not going to work with financial services clients okay uh because if i wanted so to i would on. have just joined a bank ha -ha. You know? <laughs> so uh given Given, you know, there were there was plenty of work across the board, I started working with the UK Ministry of Defense, which I thought will be exciting. You know, we'd be thinking about like, what very is the exciting. state of war in the world and therefore how many battle tanks or aircraft carriers or, you know, guns they're going to need. Like in a Top Gun movie or like... Pretty much. I'm the guy who says, you know, <laughs> press this button, there's 15 <laughs> tanks available. <laughs> Uh, turns out it wasn't that. Turns out it was very <laughs> detailed, low-level procurement, a lot of which I wasn't getting any information on because I wasn't security cleared oh. as a foreigner. And so I used to work on these Ministry of Defense projects and hang out with my buddies on the financial services floor <laughs> because obviously I couldn't be at the client side because yeah. I didn't have security clearance. And then they'd be talking about, you know, whatever it was that's happening in the world of finance. And I'd be sort of sat there worrying about um, tent shipments and whatever else uh, is needed on <laughs> and the they're battlefront. Clo they're talking about like millions of pounds in deals. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and look, I, I don't want to rain on the Ministry mm -hmm. of Defense. Obviously, it's important work that they do there in the UK. But it was just not as interesting to me. Yeah. And hanging out with my friends on the finance floor, at some point, someone said, right, you need to be doing something more interesting. Yeah. And I agreed. <laughs> and I ended up on a project in 2009 where um, we were effectively shaping a large bank's response to a big regulatory challenge mm -hmm. and my first role there was managing a uh, business case 
worth 130 million pounds. Wow. So that is what, 1,300 crore rupees? Essentially. Yeah, so 1,300 crore rupees. <laughs> uh, effectively, all of it mm -hmm. in my hands. And and day and night, uh, I, I'd sort of be wondering, you know, what is the next permutation of data I'm going to have to cut as a result of this, as well as telling telling very senior people off for giving me their inputs in the wrong format. So it was really <laughs> good fun. And it set me up, you know, uh, understanding the ins and outs of a financial services firm in a way that I don't think any other project would have. Yeah. And so I worked at that big four company for about six, close to seven years, did some really interesting work, went away to the Middle East, set up a new financial regulator from scratch, oh, wow. you know, helped launch a uh, brand new insurance business in the UK. So it was all really good fun. Uh, and then I decided I want more of this. So I went across to um, one of the largest European Finally banks. working for a bank. A bank, exactly. <laughs> and that was cool as well, because um, this, this bank wanted to be one of the big five in global wealth management. Mm -hmm. And and by this time, I'd sort of honed my way into the strategic space. So I was working on strategy with them. Um, firstly, defining what that strategy needs to be. Secondly, then implementing it. And then, you know, managing a whole range of fires um, mm -hmm. that so all for, banks were So for the bank itself, right? So yes, you strategize right. their next move and their growth, etc. Correct, correct. So I worked nice. with the CEO, the CEO, nice. and the entire management team, which mm -hmm. was good, which was fantastic exposure yeah. because after a while in that room they forget mm -hmm. that you're the junior one they forget that you're the younger yeah. one you're just one of the people in the room and you know you get to firstly observe and learn but you also get to contribute which yeah. was fantastic which is a big thing early in my career um after which i then moved banks again mm -hmm. um in 2017 and i think this was more a decision led by uh, wanting a greater uh, set of alignment mm -hmm. uh, with priorities, commonly known as work-life balance. Um, <laughs> and that's been just, a really you interesting... You just jazzed up work-life balance right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually have a different approach to work-life balance. I think work-life balance needs to be driven by priorities. Yeah. And there's going to be chapters in our life where work is the priority. And, and we can't have it on an equal balance with with, with family. everything else. Yeah. And then there's going to be chapters in our life where family needs to have the greater 100%. tip. So I think aiming to achieve a balance between the two is probably the wrong mindset that, you know, that holds a lot of people back. I agree. I think it's balance at different stages in your life. Exactly. Pre like you pretty said. much. Yeah. And I don't like the word work-life balance because li work is a part of life. Exactly. It's work and family and social life and this and that. There's a lot to balance. It's, it's an just... aligned life. Yeah, that's that's exactly. the way I look at it. So, uh, and, and then sort of I've been with that bank uh, for about six years, coming on seven actually now. Mm -hmm. um, and I've done a whole bunch of really cool things for that bank yeah. as well. I've led the entire branch, bank branch strategy, which being the largest network in the UK was super interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I've helped launch a new wealth management business there, which wow. was a total deal value of about uh, 75 billion pounds. Again, so we're talking 75,000 crores. Is that the number? Throwing absurd numbers <laughs> around now. <laughs> so, you know, again, that was really good fun. And then I was um, pulled into the commercial bank mm. a couple of years ago, um, effectively working with... Uh, the bank and the government to figure out what the uh, overall COVID response needs to be and how can we help small businesses survive. So the segment of the market that I look at, which is what we call commercial, mm -hmm. is anything between zero turnover to 100 million pounds. So anything from zero to 1000 crores, mm -hmm. I suppose, um, which is the big bulk of the market. market. And then obviously you've got a small group of very large businesses which, which would are. come under corporate. Got that it. Would so that goes corporate under banking. corporate banking. Yeah. Um, so commercial banking is actually really good fun because it's very tangible. It's very much about, you know, mom and dad own businesses. Mm -hmm. How do they continue to function? How do we make sense of a world that's changing very fast? Yeah. And how do we equip those customers of ours with tangible tools to Dude. navigate this changing world, you know, and because so, of the size of the bank that I work with, um, it's not just about individual businesses in our customer book. It's actually one fifth of the entire number of businesses in the, in UK. the UK. So it's got a tangible impact on, on uh, the not just economy. the UK economy, but effectively the global the, economy. Yeah. So it's been a really, really fun role. Uh, yeah, and it's been a few years doing that. And here I am on Mumbai talking to you about it. Nice. <laughs> I love it. Now, I noticed that through this entire little process, what one would expect 
would be a master somewhere or an MBA somewhere. But I know this because I know you personally. But um, you chose not to do an MBA or a master's. Yeah. Now, traditionally, um, especially in India, a lot of people would say that, you know, oh, how do I get into the field of finance? Yeah. Do I need to do a master's? Um, I have to have a master's to reach a certain level, etc. But looks like you're doing fine. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, <laughs> people get really surprised. They ask me, where did I do my MBA? And then I, say, I tell them I haven't. And then they said, oh, so then you've done a master's in finance. Yeah. And then I tell them I haven't. I haven't. And then they say, okay, well, what have you done your master's in? And I say, well, calm. I haven't. Calm, I've okay, done so master's in calm. Undergrad in, in finances? No, actually, I did my undergrad in history. <laughs> international relations and history. Um, <laughs> oh, which which obviously you can see my estimation falling in their eyes. But I, I do think... It's a super important question mm -hmm. because the underlying question is how does one evolve their career and what are the degrees and skill sets that you yes. need to do that? Yes. And there's two perspectives on this. I think one is the American perspective, mm -hmm. which we have inherited in India, which is that you need a, a degree at you know in the field that you're going to work in. Mm -hmm. And the other one is the British perspective, where you have people who have studied ancient Greek history um, and what? in... Oxford, who end up being investment bankers in the city of London. <laughs> and the point of that is not that we know all of the formulae and all of the concepts in depth before we come in. I think one needs to have a, fi a, a basic grasp of what finance is, mm -hmm. particularly financial services. And there's a difference yeah. between financial management, and which is, you know, P&L, profit yeah. and loss for any company, and financial services, which are loans, cash management, yeah. transactions, insurance, you know, asset management and so on. So one needs to have a basic idea of that distinction. But what one really needs is the ability to compute lots of information at pace. What one also needs is really strong communication abilities. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what really makes a difference is the third intangible, which is a willingness to learn. You know, Lacking in so many people. Which, which I don't think we are encouraged to, We're not. To, uh, to do. We're not. I think some of the greatest learning that I've had is observing effective people in action and if we think about how we've learned through at least my early educational system um it was very much through books yeah. and not as much through demonstration yeah so um i think if anyone wants to succeed in anything you know regardless of your degree obviously you need a degree yeah. to become a doctor yeah. you likely need a degree to become a coder although yes. that's becoming less, less likely now yeah with, you because know, the there, are, there are courses and you have to learn but the, you can upskill yourself exactly but in financial services you need to be uh, certainly good with numeracy you need to be very good with logic to do strategy which is yeah. what i do um, and and then you just need those three other things like digest information quickly, synthesize it, and communicate yeah. well, and learn from others. Nice, just, like just condense that really, really well. <laughs> it's gonna be like, okay, this is what you need to do. Don't need an MBA. It's fine. <laughs> I, look, I, I think the idea that an MBA endows people with the skills to have a successful career is frankly an outdated one, and I think as any young professional, we have to reflect on the fact that a, you don't want an MBA from anything less than the most prestigious universities. Because there is frankly limited differentiation between, um, yeah, I don't no, know, an MBA is. from Johns Hopkins University and, and the University of Manchester and um, IIM Bangalore, Yeah. right? So if you really want to stand out, you want to be looking at, you know, Stanford Business School or um, Wharton or, you know, I, I, I wouldn't even say Stern in my estimation qualifies in that category, uh, which is the business school for uh, New York University. So if you want to be in the top tier of, of MBAs, you need to be shelling out upwards of one crore rupees yeah. just to do it. Right. So if you're going to be taking you're, you're going to be making a gamble or uh, an investment of one hundred thousand pounds or one crore rupees. It has to be worth it. We need to know exactly what the payoff is, is going is going to be. And I found that in my career, I just got to the grades, mm. like the, the career grades, the designations. Mm -hmm very quickly without having to do an MBA, yeah. you know. So then it became a question of, well, if I'm going to get an MBA and end up where I am already, or maybe just the next grade, which I could get anyway while I'd be doing an MBA. What's the point? What's the point? Fair. That said, I think there's a whole bunch of advantages 
for an MBA if you're doing it at the top institution, principle of which is your network. Yeah. You know, and and I think if one, um, you know, a network that someone might take like 20 years to build, you get it in, in the range in of two, two years. years. Yeah. yeah. So, so that is definitely um, yeah. an advantage. But I feel for one who has drive um, initiative, you can that create network that. can be built in different ways. Yeah, you know? that's also true. So there are different paths to reach where you want to be. Correct. Correct. It's totally possible. Yeah. And from there, from being at the bank, from doing all these wonderful things, you have decided to pivot and create content on spirituality. Yeah. <laughs> How did that happen? So it's running in parallel with my career. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm... I'm currently on sabbatical from, mm -hmm. from my banking role. We'll talk role. about that in a minute. Yeah. So, but I've been uh, working and creating content alongside. And I don't see that necessarily as doing something different, mm -hmm. but actually sharing more of the aspects of my life that I maybe wasn't sharing before. before. Mm -hmm. um, because I feel like my spiritual inclination and my study and the understanding that I've gained over it, as well as years of practice now, uh, have been instrumental to yes. whatever success I've had in my career. So, you know, when I look at India um, and and the population that we have here that is so driven, so enthusiastic, and the growth prospects are enormous, frankly. 100%. I feel like one of the things that people do need is an understanding of what will make them successful. Yeah. And if spirituality has made it successful, then it's only my duty to share that and ensure more young people become connected with it and find the tools to make their life successful. That is true. You've always had a in slight inclination towards spirituality and then sort of you honed it a little bit more over the last few years. Is that it? No, I went quite deep into spirituality when I was at university. Okay. I think growing up in India, uh, you you know, obviously you have you are exposed to faith, to religion, to practice and on so on. On a lot of levels. Exactly. But I think it's only when you go away that you really seek it. Yeah. At least that's how it's manifested in my life. Mm -hmm. And so about the second year of university, uh, towards the end of it, I felt like something was missing. And um, there was a friend of mine who used to run Bhagavad Gita classes at university and I would promise her every week that I'm going to make it and really? every week I should not attend uh -huh. Ghosted until it. when I did okay and when I did uh two things happened one is that I started to realize that this isn't about some abstract Concept. conception of mm. the universe it's very much about what are the challenges that you and I face in day-to-day -day life exactly and how can we navigate those um, and if it, you know, if what happened to Arjun on a battlefield 5,000 years ago was, was, um, relating to a student who was 19 years old in London, yeah. then, then it, surely it, there's some depth to it. Yeah. And I found that as a result of what started off as study uh, and then became practice, uh, I was able to not only, you know, get some degree of, uh, stability in my life, mm -hmm. But also, I was able to perform really well <laughs> at university, <laughs> and and I graduated with a with a grade, a degree grade, uh -huh. which was far higher than what I was originally uh, tracking towards. Mm -hmm. And so, for me, at just at that young age, it was a very practical thing. It so wasn't. It translated for you exactly. There were very clear, tangible results mm -hmm. for me, and so I took the lifestyle that I had built uh, as a result of this into the early years of my career. And again, it was helpful in navigating. Um, the uh, you know the 2008 financial crisis, moving jobs, mm -hmm. you know, learning about new clients every time you're in in a consulting environment. But one of the things that slowly started to erode in those early years of my career was company. Okay. Now I think with any spiritual journey, there's three things that you need: shastra, sadhana, and sangha. Shastra is wisdom. Mm -hmm. Sadhana is some form of practice. practice. And Sangha is some company on that journey with you. Now, if you're a young consultant, you're pretty much as I was, taking between two and four flights a week, you know, and it was very hard to have Sangha, yeah. even on weekends where you're effectively just recovering from the previous week yeah. and, and packing and getting ready for the next weekend, oftentimes with deadlines and working over weekends as well, which is great, you know, give, give that the energy that you need to earlier in your life. But <clears throat> gradually, because that Sangha wasn't there, I think the um, fuel that I needed for my Shastra and Sadhana started to wear out as well. 
until 2016 2017 where i was transitioning um jobs between consultancy and uh, the large bank i found myself pretty much not being able to perform any sadhana regularly okay. you know and and i felt and it also coincided with a bereavement in in the family uh, as well as a, a phenomenal implosion of my relationship which was wow. a long term thing at that time and so um it left me questioning whether the values that i had held so close for so many years were actually serving me or not and so i had a couple of years effectively walking away from spirituality in okay. in some in some respect it was only in 2018 where i found a meditation practice that i resonated with mm-hmm. and i decided to start that practice uh, start my meditation practice every day and from 2018 to now when we are in 2024 the momentum and focus that it built in my life was incredible so shastra stayed with me throughout that journey sadhana went was away and came back mm-hmm. the one thing that was missing was sangha and that opportunity for sangha mm-hmm. came in the pandemic okay so what ended up happening is a bunch of my friends who are all ceos company founders startup creators um approached me to start a study of the bhagavad gita and we started a class that's now been running for two and a half years wow and throughout that journey they were encouraging me to take the contents of our discussions public mm-hmm. and then that branched out into two very specific fo- specific and public forms of service mm-hmm. one is all of the youtube content that i put out which is you know weekly 10 to 15 minute videos of. with key concepts mm-hmm. verse by verse chapter by chapter of the bhagavad gita mm-hmm. and the hanuman chalisa so one week we have bhagavad gita and one week you have the hanuman exactly. chalisa so that's one um avenue and then the other one was one on one conversations with business leaders and startup founders and senior executives effectively coaching them with their life and performance using the concepts of the bhagavad gita so that's one on one coaching that you also do as a form of service correct and and look i think people often ask me like why is it a form of service you know you're you're charging for it and and there's two or three reasons why i think firstly <clears throat> it helps enable all of the other content creation that we're doing of course which you know to scale really needs to be self sustainable and secondly because it is a form of service to the business leaders yeah i think if we've got a generation of enlightened leaders who are influenced by timeless knowledge yeah. that can be very practically implemented in their leadership style who act from a position of abundance not scarcity and who are well equipped to deal with challenges yeah. what that does is it has a quantum impact on the organizations and the economy that they're in you know and i've seen what a con- quantum impact one person can create, can create. you know on an so entire imagine, economy in my day job so imagine creating so many business leaders exactly so well equipped you know, to 50 to 100 leaders is all that it takes to change the destiny of a country you know and if you can influence that i'm not i'm not Why sort of not? you know i'm not putting myself out there saying that i'm going to do it if, if you one, can even add to it that's amazing and and that's effectively the form of what what that service has taken nice that's amazing so you've had a little bit of a hot and cold relationship with spirituality i've been hot and cold with spirituality i think spirituality has held my hand throughout nice i like that i know a lot of times people do struggle with spirituality So let's let's backtrack a little bit and define what we mean by spirituality because um there's a lot of discussion about being spiritual versus religious and like there's a whole sort of pandora's box situation happening over there <laughs> Yeah yeah no I mean look s- speaking about spirituality and religion across the world mm-hmm. has been largely in the private domain particularly in the west and I think coming out of the pandemic everyone wants something that's going to be grounding for them yeah and that grounding has taken different forms mm-hmm. some people have gravitated towards um organized religion mm-hmm. and others have gravitated towards you know faith that's deeply held in their own hearts and others have gravitated towards loosely defined forms of spirituality which includes you know crystals healing and mm-hmm. and all of that and all of that's fine but i think whichever level we operate at we need to understand that we're all on the search for some form of truth um and the way i look at it is you know it reminds me of this cross section of the earth 
which is a diagram that I'm sure everyone has studied when they were like 10 you, or 12 years old. You have just taken me back to school in Basu's class <laughs> studying biology. <laughs> studying so, biology. Yeah, so, so this is this is this is geography um, where we look. If we look at the Earth, there's an outer layer which is yes. the you know the atmosphere. Then you have the surface layer. Then you have the crust. Then you have the mantle, and then finally you have a core. Yes. Similarly, on a spiritual journey, we have lots of different layers. Okay. And what everyone is searching for is the truth. That is the core, the core. of all spiritual exploration. Mm -hmm. And different approaches call the truth different things. In our dharmic approach, that truth is referred to as Satchit Anand. And that also is a description of something that is beyond words. So we say ice cream is sweet. Mm. But for someone who's had a fantastic ice cream, sweet is quite a limited definition term. of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's... So in the same way, Sachidanand is trying to capture something that's beyond words mm -hmm. into words. And I think that core of truth mm -hmm. that is deeply personal and accessible to everyone is the core of what we are searching for. Okay. Beyond that core, we have a next layer, which is philosophy. So philosophy At answers 11. the question, okay, if there's a truth, what is my relationship with, with the truth. truth? And there are actually in the Vedas six schools of philosophy, which includes yoga. Interesting. It's not just about it's asanas. Form. Correct. It's but a it's form a school of, of philosophy mm -hmm. that includes asanas. Mm -hmm. The third layer above that is theology, which okay. is what is our conception of the divine and answers the question, what is, what is my the, relation with the, with divine, the divine and the truth? How do we square this circle? Mm -hmm. uh, that layer of theology in Sanatan Vedic Dharma, which we now call Hinduism, includes different sampradayas. Mm. So you have Vaishnav Sampradaya that sees Vishnu as Supreme. You have Shaiva Sampradaya that sees Shiva, Shiva. as Supreme. You have Shakta Sampradaya that sees Devi as Supreme. You have Ganapatya Sampradaya that sees Ganapati. Ganesha as Supreme. You have Kumar Sampradaya that sees, um, that sees Kartikeya as Supreme. And you have one sampradaya that has unfortunately diminished, if not disappeared, mm -hmm. which is Saurya Sampradaya, which, which is? is Surya as Supreme. Ah. So you have these six principal sampradayas at the highest level. Mm -hmm. Then there are different Vaishnava sampradayas, Vaish, different within Shaiva that. sampradayas mm -hmm. and so on. But at the highest level, you have a layer of theology that defines who is the divine. The Supreme. And what is the relationship between me, and the divine and the truth. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's how these three layers mm -hmm. are engaging. Beyond that layer of theology, you have a layer of practice, okay. which includes methods of worship, puja, yagya, you know, meditation, japa, mm. all, of, all of that comes in that layer. Outer layer. And it also includes uh, our perspective on ethics, on morality, on structuring society and so on. So that layer of practice is all about how do I access the divine, myself, and the truth. Yeah. Right. So that layer of practice is about access. Mm -hmm. The next and final layer is history. What is the historical experience mm -hmm. of a faith? And if you take this structure, any well-versed person of faith mm -hmm. should be able to tell you what are the different layers and what are the different conceptions at each layer. Interesting. Now what happens is, Quite often, people only operate at one layer. Yeah. Or operate at that, and which is fine, you mm. operate at that layer with an understanding of who we are, what is the truth, what is our relationship to it, how does our practice enable that, mm -hmm. how does our history inform that? You know, one can operate at the layer of history yeah. and address some of the experiences that have mm -hmm. happened as, as the faith has wound mm -hmm. its, you know, thousands of years journey. But never by divorcing ourselves from that core of truth. Because the core of truth, in my understanding within Hinduism, says that the truth is one. In fact, the truth alone is. is. And wise people call it by different names. And this isn't just, you know, a live, laugh, la love type of <laughs> saying I saw on, on, on someone's board. Yeah. It's actually mentioned in the Rig Veda. Mm -hmm. Ekam sat vipra bahuda vadanti. The truth is one, the wise call it by different names. names. And so having this approach mm -hmm. has enabled two things. 
One is that it has enabled me to lead a very effective life. In the sense that even though I practice Hindu forms of worship, like pujas and havans, and I've had the joy of conducting a handful of weddings even so far, nice. it always connects not just me, but whoever I'm performing those forms mm -hmm. of worship with to that underlying truth. Nice. And I think the best compliment that I get after weddings is mm -hmm. when people come up to me and say, now I know what happened in my wedding. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can actually show them a little bit of a insight to what it means. Correct. So when people say religion versus spirituality, mm -hmm. I don't see them as two separate, separate things. things. I see them just simply people operating at different layers of the same continuum. Got and I think if people who call themselves spiritual mm -hmm. can understand the Nuances. practical enablement of that their the spiritual practice. journey with that you know mm -hmm. religion will give them mm -hmm. then that would be really powerful equally right. people who consider themselves spiritual if they were to take their practice and go a little bit deeper mm. and say well what does this actually mean? mean what is it pointing us towards then that would be of great benefit Got i'll it. give you one example mm -hmm. we see bhagwan shri vishnu yeah stood on a lotus yes. with four arms yes. and each of those four arms holds something different yes. or is doing something different. Yes. So one arm is blessing us, mm -hmm. a second arm is holding a kaumodaki, which is the name of his gada, mm -hmm. his mace. In one, in another hand, he is holding a shankha, mm -hmm. which is the conch shell and on another hand, he's holding a chakra, which is a discus. What does this tell us? It tells us that a lotus which holds the divine, is born in a mud pond, but rises above it. So too was, must we live in the world that has everything. But it has the capacity to give life, it has muck, mm -hmm. but we, we should rise, rise above, above it, it and not be touched by it. Now, what a wonderful message. Yeah. Then you have the four hands. One is holding a uh, mace, mm -hmm. which is to smash through any obstacles. Another one is holding a chakra, mm -hmm. which is to cut through any attachments that we might have to outcomes. This should happen. That should not happen. The third one is shankha, mm -hmm. which is any speech that we perform should anywhere, be. any action that we perform mm -hmm. should purify the place. You know, any time one blows a shankha, yeah, it purifies the place. feel a sense of purity mm -hmm. and peace in that space. Mm -hmm. And then as a result of all of this rising above the world, smashing through barriers, cutting attachments mm -hmm. and purifying our inner and outer world, mm -hmm. what ends up happening? We receive the benediction of the divine. Interesting. So if one is at a layer of mm. practicing spirituality or practicing religion and are very deeply drawn into the pujas and so on, an understanding of what philosophically each imagery represents would be extremely valuable. Yeah, 100%. It will be. And, you know, what's really interesting is that actually a lot of it is directly translatable. Mm -hmm. Even, I mean, if you think about, you know, what happened at the very outset of the Bhagavad Gita, yeah. you see a lot of behaviors that we exhibit even today. So the two armies are facing each other. Yeah. And uh, we actually start not with a discussion on what Arjuna was doing, mm -hmm. but Dhritarashtra, who's the blind king, asks Sanjaya, who's narrating what happened on yes, the battlefield. Yes, because he can't see, so he needs it needs to be narrated to Exactly. Him. And Sanjaya starts by talking about what Duryodhan is doing, mm -hmm. his own son. Yeah. And he says, look, you know, Dur Duryodhan goes up to his guru and arrogantly says, <laughs> look at your smart students on the other side. The other side. Now, He's taunting. Taunting his own guru. Yeah. Then what he starts to say is... Look, they have this warrior and this warrior mm. and this warrior and this warrior. Mm. But we also have this warrior and, and that warrior, warrior and that warrior. Then he says, the foremost amongst all of our warriors is Bhishma. Mm. So all of you other guys protect Bhishma. Now Bhishma is his grandsire and yeah. he is actually an enlightened being. Mm. And he's listening to this thinking, oh my God, this guy's running his mouth. <laughs> And I can mm. see that mm. it's his insecurity. That is and in acting his up. insecurity, he is insulting his guru and he is insulting all his allies. So I better it's, cut him out. Yeah. And in that situation, he blows his conch. And that is an act of signifying that the war has started. started. Now, when he blows his conch, mm. all of the other warriors pick up their conches and start blowing it as well. Now, when 
they are blowing it the pandavas are not wants to be left behind so they pick up their conches and start blowing as well mm-hmm. and you can just imagine in the din and roar of this battlefield when not only conches are blowing but horses are neighing yeah. elephants are trumpeting yeah. you know swords are rattling in that environment the bhagavad gita is given not in the peace of uh, the himalayas yeah not in a forest yeah. not in an ashram away from everything so the first message is that this exposition the of the chaos. truth is for our day to day lives for our battles in our battlefields in and through yeah. of the noise for din our, roar traffic threat inner and outer struggles exactly so that's the first thing mm-hmm. second thing is arjun has the same insecurity not the same insecurity but is triggered in a similar way Wait. as duryodhan was mm-hmm. but what arjun does is he says to krishna take me to the middle of the battlefield so i can see who we are fighting and arjun uh, krishna knows shri krishna knows what yeah, is in what, his heart yeah so shri krishna takes him right to that part of the battlefield mm-hmm. where he is facing the strongest kaurava warriors including bhishma mm-hmm. and his guru drona and arjuna's guru dronacharya Drona and that triggers a nervous breakdown in arjun yeah literally the language that he uses vepatushya sharire me romaharsha shjayate gandiva samshate hasta and you know he just lets loose and he says i am not going to fight this war it's like how how it's just not it's not possible yeah and you know krishna prods him further he doesn't yeah. console him in the beginning he prods him he's like klebhyam masma gamaf parta naitatva yupapadyate you know he's like this is unmanly behavior mm. look at yourself in public you have broken down this how does not be befit you you know like yeah. gives him like the how can you behave this way fire. <laughs> at that time arjuna focuses his he gets his mind focused on why he is breaking down mm. and he says look i really can't bring myself to fight my own my kin my own family what is the point of this war where i not only will i be responsible for their deaths but the major kings and the major armies of the entire country would be engaged in destroying each other what is the impact that that will have on society yeah and that's the point at which krishna says you think you are killing but the soul is never killed by a sword so you must rise above. above this conception that you are this body that is going to live and die and then there's a discussion on okay so what does it mean to live what is the purpose of life how must we act in the world what is our connection with the divine which you know very interestingly starts to cover those first three layers that first four know. layers at least mm. it covers the truth it covers philosophy it covers theology, theology and it covers practice and understanding that's and there's so many examples mm. how i work a lot with my coaching mentees talking them through how to control anger yeah like how how as a leader am i not going to be angry when situations are going my way well there's very practical guidance mm-hmm. how do we control addiction which mm-hmm. is a which major is a major challenge, challenge yes. how do we control anxiety and fear very very practical guidance available to us i mean i and look we started this discussion with a recap of my uh, career journey mm-hmm. but i am very happy to say that wherever i've got to it's been informed by the wisdom that i've gained from the bhagavad gita and other yeah. shastras that's that's actually amazing because the explanation of how these things are practically related to what we are doing today the struggles inner and outer how these scriptures kind of help guide us on yeah. our path i want to pivot a little bit and ask you a question that i think our listeners will be very intrigued to know mm-hmm. now you are obviously much um, better read in all these scriptures than me um is there a mention about how we should look at money how we talk about money or is there anything that um indicates in the scriptures about how one should handle or visualize money or their mindset towards money what it should be like yeah, there's a wealth no pun intended <laughs> of information <laughs> about money mm-hmm. now i think conventionally when you think of religion and money there's some idea and i don't really know where it comes from mm-hmm. um 
that says that money is evil wealth yeah, is evil yeah yeah it's also in pop culture right like all the villains will be like super rich and like this poor working class guy will come and fight them and all yeah. that <laughs> <laughs> and 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 it's just completely untrue yeah. you know i i think in um in hinduism there are four purposes of life okay one of them is money Interesting. Okay, so they are known as four purusharthas, mm-hmm. and the four purusharthas are dharma, artha, kama, moksha. Dharma, is money. which is can be a podcast on its own, just figuring out what dharma is. Interesting. Um, but very simply, comes from the root word dhr, hmm. which also is the word for dharyate. So dharyate iti dharma, that which upholds, is dharma. So if we think about it in its very essential sense. Hmm. the dharma of sugar is sweetness the dharma of so, the sun is light and heat so is it your purpose it is your essential nature okay the essential nature of sugar is sweet hmm. if it was not sweet it would not be sugar yeah the it, essential nature of the sun is to give heat and light if it didn't give heat and light it, it would wouldn't. not be the sun and that's where dharma comes from so if we were to take that concept and apply it in our own lives so where we are your essence ah essence mm-hmm. is dharma and acting in alignment with that essence is to live a dharmic life which we could easily say is being authentic being yourself being who we truly are yeah. so dharma being ourselves mm-hmm. is one of the purposes of life being authentic and being able to live authentically mm-hmm. is hugely important the second one artha. is artha mm-hmm. which i'll pause and come back to okay because that's where the discussion on money comes mm-hmm. in the third one is karma karma is recognizing that we obtain joy mm-hmm. from this world that we live in we obtain pleasure from the world that we live in mm-hmm. a married partnership is a huge source of inner fulfillment we obtain joy from having this plant here from listening you know? to music exactly mm-hmm. so the the enjoyment of the world mm-hmm. in alignment with dharma is called kama and that's why we actually have kama sutras yeah. and we have you know couples embracing on the walls of mm-hmm. temples because yeah. it's a recognized part of human life yes so third is kama and fourth is moksha moksha is to live in alignment with the mm-hmm. first three and purify ourselves to the so extent so that we can attain that we can attain the highest and the highest interestingly is also our true nature <laughs> <laughs> you know when you think about what is the core yeah the core is who we are sachidanand is who we are hmm. and how we attain that and the attainment of that is moksha now that we have understood that there are four let's come back to artha mm-hmm. what does artha mean artha means the means <laughs> oh the, the means, means to, to our attain living something is artha the means to go from mumbai to pune is, is the express way yeah yeah so in the same way we need the means mm-hmm. to be able to, to undertake attain. all the other three purusharthas wow so that's the way to go exactly. through them and that includes wealth mm-hmm. but it also includes values they work to they, they work, work together very closely together you know and that wealth plus values mm-hmm. is personified in our culture as shri lakshmi ji ah you know and there are very interesting stories mm. around shri lakshmi ji that we know in pop culture for yeah. like in so popular many. culture so many i don't mean k pop i mean popular <laughs> culture um that we know in popular culture yeah. like so one uh, conception is lakshmi ji is chanchal she doesn't mm. stay in one place for very long so if you have money you're not going to keep it for very long you know which is a very interesting idea yeah. because what it tells us mm. is that wealth without values is, is not, not going, going to, to stay. stay how many people have won the lottery and become millionaires and then gone broke yeah the vast majority why yeah. because they don't have the inner emotional infrastructure to, to deal it. with what's come you know any fool can earn money anyone can earn money to but hold on to it is to hold on mm-hmm. to it and grow it mm-hmm. and have it available for next generation and to infuse the f- future generations with the emotional capability and understanding and it. values to manage that money so how this is personified mm-hmm. is that lakshmi ji in popular culture mm-hmm. 
again in imagery that we have in hinduism is shown seated at the heart of bhagwan shri narayan yeah. so if you see tirupati balaji mm-hmm. venkateshwara lakshmi ji will always be at his heart mm. which says to keep lakshmi ji in your life you have to work on, on your that heart. which is close to venkateshwara's heart narayan's heart and narayan's heart is motivated by service interesting so lakshmi ji is not just an end in herself mm-hmm. she is a means of serving mm. the combined divinity that we see as lakshmi narayan so there are many examples in shastra mm-hmm. that illustrate this point mm-hmm. of wealth plus values uh one is uh, adi shankaracharya who is a great luminary who wrote commentaries on you know bhagavad gita upanishads brahma sutras and wrote a series of guidance texts himself called prakarana ganthas wrote one such text called viveka chudamani in which he lists shad sampatti okay. or the six types of wealth mm-hmm. and those are shama dama uparati titiksha samadhan shraddha which are the shama dama uparati mm-hmm. the ability to withdraw not engaging and walk away from things that trigger us okay and situations that trigger us mm-hmm. shama dama uparati mm-hmm. titiksha forbearance shraddha faith faith not even faith trust if i put mumbai Your to pune in, in, in on the Google gps Ma- i will take me i have shraddha <laughs> if i in don't Google. <laughs> if i don't have shraddha on that you gps and i take it they said they need no i'm not going to go left i'm mm. going to go right you can literally go off the mountain yeah that's true <laughs> so shraddha spiritual gps mm. when and you have shama shama dama upariti titiksha forbearance mm-hmm. shraddha, shraddha faith trust you automatically attain samadhan satisfaction yeah which is what we would today see as a sense of abundance yeah so we're not chasing to fill a hole that's inside us we are acting to express the sense of satisfaction that we have in our life and these are the six types of wealth now you tell me hmm. if one is able to control their distractions and control their triggers mm-hmm. and forbear difficult situations mm-hmm. and have trust in a greater plan that's taking place and work from a place of abundance is earning wealth that difficult the richest person on the planet exactly <laughs> so what our shastras do hmm. is marry the attainment of the means to live a good life also with, with the goal, the goal. of what a fulfilled life looks like hmm. and that together is what we call the purpose of wealth in hindus very interesting because a lot of times um people say that you know when you're praying to god or in general having a havan at home yeah. etc they like keep money out of it don't think about the cost or don't think about this because money is again looked at very in a negative kind of way because your faith has nothing to do with money but money is again like you said a means to live in this world and that is our purpose in this world yeah. so it is referred to and it is spoken about in depth in our scriptures which i have found out just today so i'm thank you very much yeah <laughs> i think the best way to think about is mm-hmm. there's absolutely no guilt in the pursuit of wealth mm-hmm. so long as there's a purpose attached to it that's brilliant and i think once when someone sets their goal mm-hmm. sets a sense of purpose in life then the attainment of the means to live that purpose is Impossible. valuable what becomes difficult hmm. is setting is we that see purpose wealth as a purpose in itself yes i was just going to say so many people say that you know my goal is what to make lots of money yeah. that's not a goal <laughs> so one of the things that i work a lot with the clients that i work with mm-hmm. is what does success mean to you yeah and i hear a variety of responses mm. on this subject uh that largely focus on i want to attain this in my professional life in the mm-hmm. next year which is fine and then we work further probe further mm-hmm. and say well, what about your health oh yeah yeah i want to do this in my health what about your family life oh it's not great i could do with a b c so how does mm-hmm. your definition of success mm-hmm. align with these other things that you want to achieve and then you have this aha moment <gasps> 
इसका तो मैंने सोचा ही नहीं था एंड वॉट पीपल एंड अप विध इज अ मोर एक्सपेंसिव डेफिनेशन ऑफ सक्सेस यू नो रियली आई थिंक कम for your viewers who are very mm-hmm. driven smart individuals mm-hmm. who want to achieve things everyone needs to ask themselves two questions mm-hmm. one who is the ceo of your life are you the ceo of your life or are, is your boss the ceo of your life yeah. are market circumstances the ceo of your life yeah. is your children's school schedule the ceo of your life mm-hmm. who is the ceo of your life? are you living your life or being driven by others guys it's you uh hints it's you <laughs> <laughs> it's you it's you and that's the first question mm-hmm. who is the ceo once we figure out i am the ceo mm-hmm. and this is what success means to me mm-hmm. and that is an inclusive definition that includes all of the other Multiple parameters of my life, of your life then the next question is to ask who is if i am the ceo who are the board members of my life mm-hmm. whom am i turning to guidance whom am i turning to for comfort whom am i turning to for wisdom whom am i turning to for coaching all whom am i turning to for joy yeah and all of us are turning to something or the other ha huh? or multiple people at multiple stages exactly so what i suggest for everyone is once you get a sense of control over your lives it's really important to build that board Yeah. You know and and that board could include YouTube videos by a YouTuber whom you've never met in your life and that's fine but there's Perfectly. someone guiding you or there's something guiding you that board could include a book yeah or a type of a genre of books yeah. or for example you mentioned what gives you joy exactly. music for example gives yeah. me a lot of joy so music could be a board member a particular song could be a board member of your life that makes you an effective ceo yeah, yeah. you know often times people just turn to things without being conscious of it very true and i think that's where we have an uptick in addiction that i think across the board is is almost a second pandemic that we're seeing and the worst thing is it's a silent pandemic the results of which aren't visible for to a lot of people and for a period of time but when they come out mm. my god they're challenging why do you why do you say that um addiction is driven by because of this so there um there's Because, two there's hmm. two uh eminent psychologists whom I'm going to quote mm-hmm. um whose work uh has informed a lot of my thinking in this space one is someone called hello what <laughs> <laughs> he's come for the right hello so one is someone called gabor mate mm-hmm. who uh, is a hungarian born um psychologist currently lives in um in canada mm-hmm. and his um fundamental hypothesis is that addiction comes from trauma mm-hmm. and the definition of trauma is either something very bad happened in life or not enough good things happened, happened. in life and i think the latter does apply to a lot of people and these sort of combinations work in very pernicious ways particularly in the world in which we are living and that's where the second hypothesis comes in which is by a british psychologist called johan hari mm-hmm. who links addiction with the absence of communities and he says that we have a loneliness epidemic in society and if you look across society isn't it true it is especially western society so in the uk where i live across all ages yeah children are lonely because they don't have access to their parents mm-hmm. parents are lonely because they need to keep working to keep the show on the road and don't have enough time with their partners or children and the elderly are lonely because well they off on their own homes or in care homes yeah. the same is happening in the us the same is happening in much of europe and unfortunately the same is down. happening in india yes. and there's and um apart from the sort of social or economic reasons for it there is a multiplier effect that is created by um social media as it exists today and oh the sort of God. algorithms driving it don't even get me started which effectively give us the illusion of connection while simultaneously disconnecting us, us from each other and it also gives us the illusion that everybody else but me is having a great time exactly <laughs> and so you end up in the situation where either there's a hole that needs to be filled mm-hmm. which has been created by trauma mm-hmm. and you're not healing from it oh. and plus or 
there's a hole that's being created as a result of isolation within society and so the reality is that we're seeing people turn to objects or experiences to fill that void. void and you know i think when we were growing up addiction usually referred to alcohol mm. um, gambling potentially drugs if it was particularly mm. bad i think today we have addictions of all sorts we have addiction to smartphones we have addiction to the internet we've got addictions to pornography i mean you've got a 26 year old man who spent half his life hypothetically mm -hmm. being addicted in this way who is then society to hold their hands yeah who is there to lift them up i've personally found that there's a lot of guidance in scripture in the bhagavad gita so in our youtube channel for example mm -hmm. we did not one not two but three videos with specific scriptural reference and very practical tools that we can apply as a result of that to be able to not just focus our mind but actually overcome addictions That's now keen to say addiction anxiety all of these are medical challenges and one should seek medical treatment yes. but for someone who doesn't have access or someone who wants to augment the impact of medical treatment or maybe just supplement it exactly you have tools available and yes. that's you know on that note a little plug in please guys <laughs> um like share and subscribe to his <laughs> channel as well uh, and ours please don't forget it <laughs> yeah <laughs> i feel like the fundamental question that people should ask themselves mm -hmm. whether they're trying to build their career or in an established place trying to build wealth mm -hmm. is what does an effective life consist like. of mm -hmm. and is that definition of an effective life mm -hmm. true to me who i am or is it something that i have just absorbed from the ether Got you know it. and once we have clarity on these two things actually there's a very wealthy life that can be lived that's that's amazing now this gives me a little bit of a segue to what i wanted to ask you next um we obviously are in what we call the kaliyug yeah and there are a lot of people who and a lot of times people think or actually have stepped back from morality spirituality this has taken a back seat in a lot of people's lives but there is still somewhere where people want to reconnect back uh dip into their roots dip into their selves yeah um how does one begin if they want to do that so i think we should go back to those three principles that we spoke about mm -hmm. shastra sadhana and sangha and i think if one has these three mm -hmm. one develops the right infrastructure in which to live their life spiritually mm -hmm. not to live a spiritual life as if that's separate from the life that we're living yeah but to live the life that we're living just spiritually imbued with spirituality yeah. you know so shastra um wisdom can come from books it can come from youtube videos it can come from podcasts it Plug can come from plug number 2 yeah <laughs> uh, it can come from audio books there's so many places that it can come from and if you want the traditional route it can, it can come from mm -hmm. actual pravachans mm -hmm. from classes and so on mm -hmm. so shastra figure out where your shastra is Comes coming from. from find a mechanism that's aligned with your life mm -hmm. i have a friend who listens to youtube talks on their way to work, work. and said to me is like your youtube walk uh, your talks are perfect because it's they... 10 to 15 minutes long and it takes me 10 to 15 minutes to get to, to work. work so i've consumed one <laughs> uh you know whatever you send me i consume the that one on the monday nice. and then that helps me for the rest of my week so nice. shastra yeah. when do you need it how much do you need it mm -hmm. and make sure that you're consuming it sadhana is very um sadhana is the one that i think gets quite tricky mm -hmm. because um the practice the practice mm -hmm. the sadhana uh, methods of um meditation and so on are slightly harder to get to mm -hmm. but i do feel like we have organizations who are now enabling people to access that sadhana in a clear way mm -hmm. with a structured learning program i think you've got sadguru you've got art of living you know there's a lot of um teaching around japa that mm -hmm. takes place at iskon you have chinmaya mission with their own methods of meditation so if you want to go down an organizational route those are there mm -hmm. if you don't want to go down an organizational route you have apps coming up like level yeah. supermind launched mm -hmm. by our friends mm -hmm. uh, harshil ranveer and others mm -hmm. that are doing fantastic things in the space of meditation practice you've got international apps as well like calm and headspace i've tried them i haven't found them very rooting in mm -hmm. my experience 
uh, but I I do like um, some of the content on Level, so I, I I think that that's a really valuable source to look to. I think there's some meditations by me, guided meditations recorded mm-hmm. in my voice, um, that can people can use, and you know that then become an enabler of their own spiritual practice. So the opportunities exist mm-hmm. for sadhana. Find some sadhana and do it. Every day, even if it's chanting Om loudly five times in the morning, just do it. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't take long. So sadhana and sangha. I think sangha is a very interesting thing because um, community need not always be spiritual. Mm-hmm. Community just needs to be that which nourishes us. So are we taking time to be with those who are nourishing us for who we are? Surrounding us with the right people. Exactly. You know, and are we getting enough of a counterbalance from the people we are surrounded by mm. like people talk about oh my organizational my organization is very political and you know i don't like playing office <laughs> politics but here you are spending six out of seven days surrounded by them yeah. so look either you Get navigate that yeah. or exit that or figure out what community is going to nourish you when you're in a environment that drains you yeah you know and yes there are youth groups in mm-hmm. every spiritual organization mm-hmm. but you know I'm, I'm not here to promote an organizational idea of spirituality i want to have a very democratic and accessible and relatable idea of spirituality which tells me that community can come anywhere, anywhere. so yeah so three three very simple things shastra sadhana sangha that anyone in any phase of life no matter how challenging your life is no matter how much you're hustling no matter which you economic background you come from things and you can find your way back to spirituality yeah, exactly I live a spiritual life live a spiritual life yeah because you have to live life you have to live life yeah. might as well it's not out of if spirituality is not some like you don't have to go to some and, mountain and exactly. become a sa- sadhu <laughs> and there's a very good reason to live spiritually mm-hmm. and that reason is not a moralistic reason Okay. People often assume that oh, because just you know, because you want to become holier like... than no, <laughs> the reason one must live in this way mm-hmm. is because these ideas have endured for thousands of years, and there are many practical examples of how those who have lived their lives have lived effectively, mm. not just now in today's world where But one for can you go you go <laughs> exactly so one very interesting example mm-hmm. which I, which i won't spend too long talking about but one very interesting example in the bhagavad gita is that in the entire gita bhagwan shri krishna mm-hmm. only mentions one person by name as an example of the ideal that he is discussing and that person is raja janak who was sita's father sita's from father. the so yeah. from the ramayana yeah So Bhagwan Sri Krishna mentions Raja Janak by name. Mm. Now Raja Janak didn't leave anything. He didn't go into the forest. Yeah, he had he a family a life. He was a king. He was a leader. Mm-hmm. Yes, he had a guru and he had a very strong mm-hmm. spiritual practice and grounding. Mm-hmm. And you know he had very clear ideas of dharma. But he was someone living his life. Yeah, he was the CEO of his own life and he had a board of directors. Yeah. So if we can apply those same principles in our life. We, we can be the ideal can live with freedom love it i absolutely love it. i love your um sort of connotation and your explanation of it because a lot of people think that becoming spiritual or um talking about spirituality or getting into it means you're going to become like sadhu leave everything yeah. and like all these uh, worldly things behind which is not true yeah getting in touch with your spiritual self just helps you navigate this world better yeah and I'll, i love I'll, the explanation you know i had a real moment in 2021 mm-hmm. when we were coming out of the pandemic where i was like you know what i'm done with banking ah. i'm just done with this i'm going to go do something else and um and i held that idea for you know not too long mm-hmm. but for more than a moment if you know what i mean like just you know a couple of days yeah. of just being really quite set on leaving banking and then one day when i was meditating the thought came to me it says what makes you think that we don't need bhakti in the boardroom wow and it's not about singing bhajans in a boardroom no it's about the mindset i'm going to make a placard of this <laughs> and be like bhakti in the boardroom you know this is this is something i talk to a lot of the people i consult with a lot mm-hmm. of the people who are uh, my coaching mentees we talk about this like what yeah. does bhakti in your boardroom mean 
it doesn't mean that you sit with your board of directors and yeah. chant but it means that you walk into that space with an expansive an expansive idea of what your identity is and that expansiveness includes the customers that you are serving yeah. it includes the colleagues that you are working with it includes your suppliers it includes the entire ecosystem and being true to what you are there to do exactly and one when one has that the impact is multiplied much 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 larger you know so yeah. bhakti in the boardroom became a thing in my head and look we've we've <coughs> actually practically made it happen you know the decisions <laughs> that i am in a position to influence impact one fifth of all businesses in the uk which is you know one of the largest economies yeah. in the world and therefore has a multiplier effect, effect broader than me i'm not saying that i'm controlling the global economy but, but one person with a strong spiritual grounding and a practical idea of how to live it mm -hmm. can achieve this particularly mm -hmm. coming from very non privileged backgrounds mm -hmm. like i did not have wealth growing up yeah. i you know i, I it, it, as you can probably imagine <laughs> or maybe they can't on camera but you know i grew tall when yeah. i was young and so i only had like a school uniform every couple of years yeah. you know <laughs> which is fine ordinarily i'm sure lots of people go through that experience but for me that manifested as one year my trousers were too long too long and Manal the other year they were, they too, were short. too short <laughs> and this was the reality of all of my years of schooling yeah. including the two years that we shared yeah. you know when i was 14 i had only one pair of socks yeah. and that was a hugely instructive experience for me now because it really taught me what a lack of means looks like i don't want to say poverty But because a lack of means not a lack of abundance for sure exactly like when you are 14 yeah you're a 14 year old boy yeah your feet smell and your <laughs> socks get dirty i mean you're running around <laughs> oh, playing Lord. sport going to school and so i had only one pair and i was too embarrassed to ask my parents yeah because i knew that they were working too much. their best to give us a life that is at some form of sanity and equilibrium mm -hmm. and i couldn't go i mean i once went and asked for money to buy a pen mm -hmm. and my mom gave me 50 rupees mm -hmm. and so i was like chal 20 rupees ke do pen aate hai you mm -hmm. get two pens for 20 rupees so i'll go buy two mm -hmm. and give her 10 rupees back mm -hmm. and i could see in her face that she was sat there calculating i gave him 50 rupees for a pen and i thought i will have 30 rupees back ah uh. you know and and that is real challenge when yeah. you when you see in your parents eyes that they don't they are calculating what oh. the cash flow is going to be for the next meal mm -hmm. you know things are tough yeah so i was too embarrassed to tell my parents that this has happened and then you know whenever i used to get money i used to go buy socks yeah and when i was when i was when we were at school together people used to joke that om loves socks and i was like yes <laughs> i do because i know what not having this thing is and yeah. through my life when i was at university we were getting loan payments yeah mm -hmm. and like you have to be very frugal in a yeah. foreign country and calculating the interest not just the money that you're spending the, interest the that conversion you plus the interest that you're paying <laughs> back on it it was tough yeah it was tough so now if we have got to this level where okay you can influence a boardroom or you can be in a Why boardroom you should actually one should take those experiences yeah. that's an true impact. otherwise they are just echo chambers that's true now that you segwayed into this yourself now that you have some abundance yeah how do you manage your own money we have to ask everybody this yeah. because this is finally happy hour with fin cocktail okay you have to answer this question yeah no so i'll happily answer that question yes. and and how i manage my money is by having a philosophy about money okay and that's super important mm -hmm. now and this is a little bit of my own thoughts plus derivatives from other um other creators there's one really good one called Dave Ramsey which i'm yes. sure you've come across yes. um he's got seven baby steps and i think <laughs> i've extended that to about 9 or 10 mhm mm i think the first baby step mm -hmm. is do what you need to do to put food on the table <laughs> nice to have a roof over your head Basically, do what you need to do roti kapda makan let this day like one Yeah. The number of people who are sat there with no mm -hmm. intention of going into the workforce wondering what's going to fulfill them internally and I'm like bro you roti kapda makan bro you've got your electricity bill coming up yeah. like just do something yeah do it mm. and it's hard to it's hard to hear sometimes yeah but i've done like you know 
some rubbish things <laughs> roles wise yeah. you know uh, in terms of work but you you got to do what you got to do we had to do it you know i didn't like it yeah. i didn't necessarily you don't have to enjoy like it, it. Yeah. but sometimes you like you said step one you have to do what you have to do i'll give you one example once we were working with as a consultant we were working with the board of this bank mm-hmm. and uh, one of the board members needed to go present the mm-hmm. strategy and as a consultancy we were working specifically with that board member so um the partner uh, of the consultancy had spent an afternoon coaching this person on how to present and what are the some of the tough questions and how to parry them and so on and um sh- about 10 minutes before the meeting is to begin mm-hmm. she gets a panicked call from the board member uh-huh. saying i left all my notes in the office <laughs> now uh, you know in in the consultancy's office mm-hmm. which was not far from the the bank's office and so uh, the the partner said oh that's no problem om will bring it to you <laughs> and this was in scotland it was probably minus 2 in glasgow oh, and yeah. i was uh, <laughs> like sure om will bring it to you <laughs> i was there with like carrying the notes in a plastic folder shielding them with an umbrella not me so that the notes don't get wet and i was sat there thinking What years of a degree from London School of Economics, but you have to do this. You have to become a postman. <laughs> you have to do what you have to do. So the first yeah. thing is do what you need to do to put food on the table. Mm-hmm. The s- second thing is figure out what gives you meaning, mm-hmm. purpose. No, okay. Meaning is what is internally fulfilling. Got it. Like I find it meaningful mm-hmm. to spend time with my nephews. Mm-hmm. I find it. fulfilling internally got it purpose yeah. may be higher yeah and do what gives you meaning yeah you know and how that translates is i find meaning in sharing shastrik wisdom which is so why I you have do to. it yeah you yeah. have to do it yeah so so find out what gives you meaning do, do it, it. Okay. then as a result of that mm-hmm. figure out what not just what is your purpose but what are the skills and capabilities that you need to develop to live meaningfully mm-hmm. yeah so for example if i find sharing shastrik wisdom meaningful i've had to develop the skills and capabilities mm-hmm. to speak in front of a camera which as you know is not always easy yeah i think no. first videos <laughs> not at all we've all been there <laughs> we've all been there so you'll notice that the first three things are not about money yeah they are about the emotional infrastructure to manage money well mm-hmm. why because people say oh someone got money and they changed money doesn't change you you money, are that money accentuates who you are exactly money reveals who we truly are mm-hmm. so before we embark on this pursuit or before mm-hmm. we end up with this grandiose pursuit of wealth we need to build that emotional infrastructure and that's where doing what you need to do figuring out your meaning and figuring out the skills that you need to live purposefully are super important mm-hmm. and the nice thing about it is that one can do that when they are at university it doesn't have to be your whole life's purpose for the next 70 years but for the next couple of years yeah. what is it that gives me meaning if playing football on a saturday with my friends gives me meaning and helps me perform better at school why not why not yeah so uh yeah. those are three three baby steps so yeah. far fourth baby step save 1 lakh rupees mm-hmm. in cash mm-hmm. keep it in your bank account for mm-hmm. an emergency nice you will be your amazed at fund. the number of people mm-hmm. who don't have 1 lakh rupees 1000 pounds 1000 dollars i will not be amazed i see many 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 exactly. of them <laughs> you know and this is when life hits you in the face yeah, yeah? people you are know, living paycheck to paycheck and it abhors me i'm just like how my lived example was when my father passed away absolutely suddenly no idea i was on the other end of the world i had a lot of things to worry about and there's a lot of emotion there but one thing i didn't have to worry about is, is the money to spend on a ticket to come home yeah 1 right. lakh rupees rakho fourth hmm. fifth baby step is get out of debt hmm. get out of unsecured debt mm mm-hmm. Okay I'm not saying cut up your credit cards like Dave Ramsey does <laughs> I think there is value in having credit cards I think there's value in having credit scores mm-hmm. but don't buy stuff you don't need mm-hmm. with, with money you that you don't do not have. have to impress people that you don't even like <laughs> love it <laughs> get out of debt super simple yeah. you know figure out what the total 
mm-hmm. debt that one owes and this is unsecured debt what that means is credit card mm-hmm. car loan education loan ye sab mm-hmm. likh lo mm-hmm. smallest to biggest build momentum get out of it mm-hmm. it takes a bit of hard work but it is achievable yeah okay so get out of debt six Fifth. Mm-hmm. okay sixth is build an emergency fund mm mm-hmm. okay uh build an emergency fund matlab 3 to 6 months of yeah. your living expenses so you're making save my life cash. so much easier you're just telling people that i would normally tell them <laughs> so much easier this is why yeah. i have podcast guys so guests <laughs> can tell you what i so, have been doing for so long yeah i should let you know we haven't practiced this in advance okay <laughs> so 6 <laughs> is build an emergency fund mm-hmm. emergency fund 3 to 6 months of your living expenses mm-hmm. just have it in a cash account and your 1 lakh that you have saved earlier can be part of that got it okay mm mm-hmm. Seventh is build assets, mm-hmm. and building assets effectively means two things. Firstly, you should be saving for retirement, and by saving, I mean investing. <laughs> and I think investing often scares people because we have a lot of information, a lot of gyan on the internet that makes it difficult. And actually, not just on the internet. If you look at everywhere, the, if you look at the traditional sources of information like business news yeah. channels, if you look at the Newspapers. I'm not going to name them. More uh, complex than the Gyan on the internet. Certainly less about economy and more <laughs> about markets. Let's put it that way, right? So it is difficult to understand. But I think simple um, market tracker mm-hmm, index funds. funds are available uh, across the globe. Are, across the globe, exactly. So you can get exposure to multiple markets, and I think you can hedge. You know, um, yeah. emerging versus more traditional markets. So. we should definitely start saving early if there's an organizational match then max out that match because compounds over time and there's a lot of benefit that people can see just in a span even of like 5 or 8 years so if you're starting your career at 21 and you get an organizational match you know you put in for the organization puts in for you get 8% of your salary tax free in an investment account i mean i don't know what the tax implications in india mm-hmm. are but certainly in the uk these sorts of pensions accounts are mm-hmm. are tax free certain uh, also in the us um you're getting 8% of your salary invested for you mm-hmm. tax free and you can choose where it goes do it yeah. yeah and as part of seven also i would actually encourage people to think broadly about buying a home okay. and there are a lot of uh, influencers as they are called you're the first person who's actually in favor of buying a home I yeah so there's a very lot of intrigued. there's a lot of people who are not in favor of buying homes so the fundamental idea why someone says you shouldn't buy a home mm-hmm. is they look at um say uh, 10000 rupees or 20000 rupees uh which i know is quite conservative uh, or in mumbai not in mumbai yeah. matlab <laughs> tum bahar hi ho <laughs> but say chalo say you are earning 1 lakh per month and 20000 of that is going on your rent let's just take it as a hypothetical example okay what people say mm-hmm. is um that rent buys you freedom mm-hmm. to move which Correct. i think makes sense which is fair makes yeah? sense for early chapters of your life then the argument is if you take that 20000 and convert it into a mortgage mm-hmm. that mortgage firstly has interest mm-hmm. so your 20 is not going towards paying down the principal a large chunk of it is going down and paying interest instead of putting 20000 to a mortgage mm-hmm. and uh, why don't you invest those 20000 instead and the market will give you x return which means that arithmetically it your performance sense. is better yeah two things that are not factored into this mm-hmm. is firstly it's not 20 in mortgage or yes, 20 in investments thank you it is 20 in mortgage or 40 which includes 20 in rent and, and 20, 20 in investments and 20 in investments yes yeah and this is separate from your investing for yes. retirement that we have spoken about wo to alag hi hai and your expenses and your emergency fund everything is Ex- alag exactly so <clears throat> that is the first thing that the mm-hmm. arithmetic itself is off mm-hmm. but even if you can make the arithmetic work mm-hmm. the second factor is very very important to bear in mind that the arithmetic of investment versus buying a home does not account for risk it mm. assumes that the market will mm. continue historic performance over time mm. and the quotation is that the us market has performed on average um 8 to 10% 8 to 10% 10% actually is, 10%. is the official number since uh, 1930 mm mm-hmm. 
but that includes five year periods of negative growth yep. and five year periods of stellar growth yep. who knows which five year period you will encounter and and so mm -hmm. one's wealth one's net worth to my mind should include a mix of assets that are both mm -hmm. market based as in conventionally market traded as well as traded outside the, the market. market and if you look at that that includes in the indian context mm -hmm. homes jewelry mm -hmm. silver all of these things yeah. right now seven is an interesting baby step because you there's a lot of permutations and combinations around mm -hmm. it and i think that's where really the, most of your time needs to go because that is what is the hardest to figure out exactly and that's where the emotional infrastructure that you build around money in the helps. earlier business uh, earlier baby steps helps yeah. yeah so seven is build assets mm -hmm. um eight is uh save for your children's future nice. uh which is an important thing mm -hmm. and i think seven eight nine ten can be done in parallel they mm -hmm. don't have to be done sequentially mm -hmm. so um save for your children's future nine uh, so, yeah nine. nine is pay off your mortgage early because if you're buying a place might, might as, as well, well have more off. of your payment go to the principal then Correct. interest you know prepay as much as possible exactly uh, within limits because i think yeah. there are upper caps on how much you can pay before there's a penalty and depends, so depends yeah so figure that out mm. but <laughs> overpay and then the fine final one mm -hmm. and this is where i'm borrowing directly from dave ramsey mm -hmm. the final one is live and give so live well uh -huh. with the wealth that has been created in the previous nine steps mm -hmm. and give Nice, and that ties in very nicely with our discussion on of Artha God. and Lakshmi and wealth plus values that utilize that wealth to serve society. Nice. So that's my personal investment Ten philosophy. Steps. <laughs> Ten steps. <laughs> I absolutely love it. Thank you so much. On that beautiful note, where you've tied it up so nicely in a beautiful bow. on how um you think about money where it comes from and how you've practically used it to form those 10 steps for yourself and hopefully for our, for our listeners as well thank you so much om for doing this this has been incredible thank you so much for having the time and the patience for us and giving us lots and lots to think about thank you so much for having me it's been such a joy um and look i have followed fin cocktail for a long time and i have seen it go through all of its different avatars yeah <laughs> and i love that there's now a youtube avatar uh, and i get to be part of it so you know thank you for having me thank you for making me a part of your success of um, course we had to <laughs> and you know i hope the viewers listeners of this get a lot yes. of value out of it thank you so much guys you know what to do like share subscribe share on whatsapp send it to your aji <laughs> And we will see you in the next one.